So um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dr. Freddie Weinstein, and I'm a psychiatrist. I'm chief medical officer at, at Dominican Hospital. Uh, and today I'm going to be wearing the hat of an official cat herder as we look to kind of wrap up our, our discussion here with our question and answer uh, panel. Um, thanks, George. Uh, so, uh, so two of our speakers here you certainly already uh, know. I have three other uh, people to introduce to you. And uh, then I'll maybe let each of them say a few words about themselves and, and while they're here, why they're here. Uh, but I have, and I'm going to mess up this last name. Um, so in, in uh, pole position number three here, I have Rafael Gallardo. Oh, not bad. Uh, who's a college student and his, uh, his mom, Mrs. Gallardo. Uh, and then at the end, I have Ron Indra, who's a director of the Safe Schools Project uh, here in Santa Cruz. Um, so perhaps maybe I could start with just uh, having Ron tell us a little bit about himself, about his program, and uh, before we get to the formal question and answer session. So um, the Safe Schools Project has been around for about 10, 12 years. It was, it's funded by the Community Foundation, originally set up on a grant. We're under the Queer Youth Task Force and the Diversity Center, and our job is to protect LGBTQ, WQIA students and staff and parents and those perceived as. So doing a lot of good work um, and there's always a lot to do. I wanna do two quick um, public service announcements. One of them is a shout out in support of our PFLAG organization which is back up and running. They're very vibrant and so if you run into parents that need help and support, please direct them to this great resource. They meet once a month. Um, it's a great opportunity for them to talk with other parents. And then I'm going to read this because I want to get this right. Um, I've been asked by the Queer Youth Community Goals Task Force to let you know about an opportunity um, in the community to currently available to mental health professionals to assist LGBTQ youth in our community. The task force has representatives from a lot of the organizations in this room, and we're currently serving queer youth and is committed to creating a healthy and safe environment for youth and their families. And they need help in assisting in trainings, receiving trainings, donating weekly pro bono hours to LGBT uh, students and their parents. And money or bitcoins is always helpful too for what they do, educational materials. And if you're interested, please um, contact Dr. Jerry Solomon, who is in this room and he's head of this board, or uh, Bill McCabe, um, a director of youth services, and they can direct you to the right people. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ra Raphael, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and, and what brings you here this afternoon? Yeah, of course. So, I am Rafael Gallardo, student. I went to Harbor High School, Shoreline Middle School in Green Acres. Um, I am currently my first year of Cabrillo, and I am hopefully going to a four-year college afterwards to major in psychiatry. Um, I'm here because I was bullied in middle school who I was. I wasn't sure who I was and now in high school and still and hopefully will always be um, an advocate for this because it's definitely a great thing to help out others in need and just give the word and give the spread of just awareness and of just openness and just be able to let people know that you're not alone. That it definitely gets better. So best message out there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And Mrs. Gallardo, want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm Yoli Gallardo. I'm here with my son that I'm very proud of. Um, uh, ever since I found out, you know, I, I knew my son was being bullied in school. Uh, the minute I found out what was going on, I, I got very involved, you know, with the school. And any chance I, you know, I get a chance to speak to parents, um, especially to the LGBT community, especially to parents that are only Spanish speaking because they really don't have a place to go. I'm always happy to go and just even very simple, you know, I share my story and they can see that there is hope and that, you know, you're not alone out there and things will get better. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, thank you. Can, can I share something? Please. Um, Yoli worked for me for many, many years, and um, I watched them, uh, Rafael, grow up, and I watched Yoli, and I'm just, this is the most incredible family, and I watched uh, both of them on their journey and what has been going on, and had 
many hugs and tears in my office <laughs> um, through this process. And I'm so excited. I didn't know they were going to be here. And I just want another round of, you have no idea the courage of this family and what they've done and what they're doing in the community. I want you to give them another round of applause. All right, so on, on with the question. So the first question submitted um, uh, would be directed to uh, Joanne, uh, but certainly others can, can chime in. Um, and there were a few questions on this general topic, but was how would you, um, what support, what education uh, can we use to encourage bystanders to, to break away from the group, um, especially if that group of, is populated with the popular kids? How can we support that individual? Good question. So as I said earlier, it's about um, bringing the youth in and having them help you figure out what to do. So there are several programs out there, and I can't recommend any of them, but there are a lot that do that. So what I would do is, um, there's one that particular that brings in uh, the leaders from each of, we've heard cliques mentioned a lot here. So you bring in each of the clique, whatever they're called these days. When I was in school, it was the socias, the jocks. I hung out with the art and drama freaks. But anyway, you bring the leaders in from those and you come together and you have a discussion about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and they all agree. Yeah, that's not cool. And then you take the leader from, even if it's the leader of the bullies, whatever leader it, it is, and you have them go back and they go out to the school and they have the uh, bystanders become upstanders and you work within your school with the leaders from your various groups and change the culture and climate. And so everybody knows it's okay to say that's not okay. And so it's all about changing that culture and that climate and it begins with the young people. You heard the folks here earlier from SoCal saying that's what they've done. They have these groups, they have these clubs, and they're making it not okay to do those things. Anyone else want to take that one on? I'll add to that that what, um, I know you can't recommend any programs, and actually you don't need a program necessarily yeah. for it. You just want to identify the polls. They're called public opinion leaders. So you can ask, and you can email me, and I can give you a protocol for doing this. You simply ask the kids in a middle school or high school who decides how you dress, what you yeah. listen to, who are the public opinion leaders, right. bring them together. And, you know, there is Green Dot that does this around sexual violence, um, but there's other just general programming of working with the youth. But you have to find those youth that have the social capital because there's plenty of us that were in middle school and high school and we could have said something and no one would listen anyway, right? Yes. We didn't have the power, the social capital. And so this idea that we have to do this universal programming around by standard intervention actually is is not the best approach. We need to find out who are those kids that uh, really, really shape the ways in which the norms are focused. And so there's social norming approaches as well. Exactly. Ron, I saw. And it, it, it's also something as simple as empowering young people who are bystanders that they don't have to confront the bully because mm -hmm. yeah. that's frightening. All they have to do is grab the hand of the of the target and get them to safety. I'm going to get you into a room. I'm going to get you to a teacher. I'm going to get you to the office. Pull the victim out of the situation and it drops the whole power dynamics down. They do not have to stand up to the bully yeah. and they just need to know that. Yes. So the next question was asked in about four or five different ways and uh, probably the most commonly asked category of question was, and this could be open to the whole panel, is how can we translate some of the learnings uh, to the adult world with uh, adults being bullied by adults, whether it be in the workplace, the uh, NFL locker room, um, and as a sideline to that, is there any studies out there um, that speak to how bullied adolescents then become bullied adults? It's on you, Dorothy. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that we're only now recognizing that we are sending kids to potentially toxic environments in our schools. So um, we were starting to realize about 10 years ago that maybe we should be focusing on the adults in the buildings, and now only we're really kind of paying attention to that in the school climate in, uh, improvement process. Um, so if you look at even the work that you're doing in this state and in this district, uh, a lot of what Joanne talked about in the school climate improvement process is first working with the adults in the building, right? Because school climate encompasses everyone. So I think a lot of what we've been doing with kids around SEL or PBIS, and PBIS does include the adults, but it doesn't really get to some of the bullying or the mean, cruel behaviors. Teachers and staff are just as clicky. 
they are just as clicky, right? I mean, even when I do in services and professional development, I can see who are the isolated, uh, victimized teachers, and they have come up to me, right? So I think that we definitely um, need to focus on the adult culture more. We do know that kids that are victimized in pre-K are more likely to be victimized in middle school, high school, and we have just conducted a college study. If you make it to college, you will also probably be victimized there. You will be victimized in uh, your partnered relationships, and you're more likely to be prone for that in the workplace. So there's definitely continuity across, across the lifespan. I just realized the only program I can promote is Positive Behavior Intervention Support of Systems. <laughs> it's PBIS because it's, on, <laughs> it's something that we're doing um, countywide, regionwide, and that the state supports. Um, and that is one, and that's a very effective practice. Of, but it's a whole, like she was saying, it has to be all of the adults bought in as well and modeling that behavior. And sometimes they are the most challenging to make change with because you're entrenched <laughs> in your habits of how you do things. Um, it's just a matter of helping uh, understand empathy. But that is probably the most difficult one, I think, is when you're in those situations, especially work environments. Um, I've been work environments before, and I have enough sense of self to go, bye-bye, I'm not going to be here anymore because I don't want to be in an environment that's toxic. But not everybody can do that. Um, and I don't know if that does anything to help the person that's making the toxic environment. Um, but that is a very challenging. I don't know if anybody else has any suggestions. I mean, there's research that Dorothy talked about, but it, I think you just have to start from preschool <laughs> and um, help everybody have empathy and understanding and not do the power and control um, throughout wherever you are um, so that you become a, a really solid person and you have empathy and compassion for other people. And I don't know exactly how to do that. Um, so I can't really answer that. Does anybody else? Well, um so Santa Cruz City Schools is currently drafting a workplace place bullying um, policy. And it's interesting how much misinformation is out there. So part of it is getting the right definition, right um, examples of it. And we know that when we do finish the policy, I'm on the committee, the task force, we're going to have to do a lot of education. It's going to have to be rolled out because a lot of these people do not understand. Adults don't understand really bullying yet. That's why. These seminars, these symposiums are so wonderful because we're getting the word out so people are clear. And the more we do that, the more empower, we empower um, adults so they can empower their, their students. Exactly. Good job. can't see Dorothy. It's just a voice over here. here. There you go. It's the voice behind the podium. Yeah, she, she's actually halfway back home, but now. It's like the video, voice from behind the podium. Yeah. I'd like to add to that too. I think that, you know, as long as the teacher profession is seen as something that we devalue, then we're going to continue to have um, environments that are not so positive, right? If teachers continue in their first five years, 60% of them to be clinically depressed because we put so much burden on them and they can't manage the classroom and we want them to take on all the ills of society, I think we're going to continue to have this. The work that I do in schools, we work with the adults first and then we work with the kids. And a lot of the work that we do is building trust and lowering defensiveness and coming to the table because there's a lot of hurts, there's a lot of history, and we don't take what we know about organizational change and take it into the schools. Change is difficult for everyone in here. And if you've worked in a school, you know there's a change every year, right? In my districts, there's new superintendents, their tenures don't last very long, they all have agendas. The next person comes in, there's a next agenda. All that does is build mistrust and defensiveness and the, the accountability is creating a, a, a negative climate. So we've got to fight against that. And it's, it's a matter of just joining. I join with the schools I work with. I don't come in and take from them. I join with yes. them. Um, uh, this is coming just, you know, I'm just the mom, but I've always thought. No. Um, no. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just I am the mom. I am the mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you would, you would think that um, to teach your, your little kids compassion, well, it's the parent's job. Obviously, they're doing it, but I wonder if it is happening in every household because um, I know, you know, it's not the teacher's job to do everything, but I've always thought, gosh, maybe if it starts in kindergarten and every year they hear it and they hear some sort of, um, not a class, but just like a, like a talk, like an assembly kind of thing that 
something that would happen on a constant basis, you know, maybe twice a year, starting in kindergarten, and those kids keep hearing, oh, you know, it, it is good to be compassionate. Oh, what if that was my little brother? What if, you know, and they, they just learn. You imagine that it's a normal thing to be compassionate, to have a heart, but we're just all a little bit different, but I keep thinking if something like that could be implemented, because I can dream, right? <laughs> If, if that w could happen and then kids keep hearing it and, and on the other side is to say, it's, it's okay, and now I see this more with my daughter. She says, if I see something, I go report it, mom. And before, if it was me, back in the day, I would say, I, I don't wanna be a, you know, I don't want anybody to know that I went and told, because that's wrong. So it, I, I do see the changes because my, my daughter says, I don't care, you know, um, I'll go and defend the kid or I go and tell, you know, this is what I saw. So it's kind of happening, but I feel like the kids just need to hear it on a constant basis because they, they forget, you know, that summer comes by, they have all these hormonal changes, they just forget about everything. But if it was a constant reminder, be compassionate. You know, always put yourself in the shoes of that little kid who's being bullied, or that could be your little brother. Just kind of like compassion 101, I don't know. <laughs> The next question, slightly a, a different topic, but what thoughts or support could be given to the, um, uh, the bully in recovery uh, as he or she is navigating a home environment where all the new ideas uh, he or she is learning about is seen as being a sign of weakness at home? Uh, what can be done to sort of help that adolescent? Well, <laughs> okay. Um, that is challenging. Um, as I said earlier, hurt people hurt people, and you have to look at where, and it's the dysfunctional family, the healthy family, the school, and what have you. Um, no one wants to believe that their family is dysfunctional. No one wants to believe that they're doing anything wrong. I mean, hey, you know, my dad beat me, so I beat him, so what's the big deal, you know? And so you have to be very careful of how you do that. So you have to help that young person, and there's a lot of support that needs to go around the perpetrator of violence the person who doesn't have, coming from an environment that, that doesn't have the um, Compassion 101 that Yoli was talking about, and how do you help them do that? It requires probably a really intensive kind of wraparound program. I've done that. I've gone out to the home and modeled it. We can't all do that. I said, I went out to a home one time where this was happening, and I went and I said, okay, everybody, we're going to say one nice thing to each other this morning. Do you know how hard it was for that family to say one nice, and I go, oh, nope, nice. Say something nice. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything. And after I went out with them every day for a week, after a while, they changed the habit and they started saying nice things. They started having compassion. But it's really, really difficult when it's entrenched into wherever, whatever they've been doing, and they don't see anything wrong with that. They think that keeps you tough, that's what you need to do, or it's the other side, well, if he picks on me, me, um, then I told him to pick on, you know, whatever it is, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of a, a mentality. And it's a very difficult thing to change a culture, but what you can focus in on, which is what I've done, is everyone has the right to be safe. What can we do to all work together so no one feels the way this person felt? And how can you do things? Because nice begets nice. And I'm constantly telling you know, the families, nice begets nice. When you say something nice to somebody, they feel good. When you say something nasty, well, they'll say something nasty back. So that's the only thing that I've seen that I have to do, but it's a lot of work. And there may be others who know other programs, but that, it takes a long time to shift a culture, to shift the home environment, or you can put surrounds the youth. You can't change that. We can just change how you react and protect you from that and help you to see the world in a different lens. I can't change this lens that's over here. And you have to understand why there is this, what's happened with your family, what's happened, why are they going through these things. But that doesn't have to be you. And help them see that they can be somebody different. So those are the two different approaches that I've attempted um, over the years. Yeah, I interview a lot of kids that engage in the, the behaviors that we defined as bullying here today, and it doesn't take very long to um, get them to recognize that their behavior is maybe adaptive for them, but they're hurtful towards the victims. 
you have to understand in developmental psychology, kids have the capacity to code switch, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, many of the kids I work with, we can teach them all this great social emotional learning and all these strategies, but that will put them in danger on the street and in their community, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we do SEL kind of programming in the classroom, but yet they have to walk out to the streets of Chicago, or they have to go into a neighborhood that may not be an inner city, but maybe in rural where it's just tough, my people, the white people from the trailer parks, um, my people. <laughs> Those are my people too. The, yeah, so I, I think that I talk to kids about, I do not pathologize their behavior. I talk to them about the, the scale of adaptiveness and the fact that the ways in which they're getting through life works for them in those contexts, but in the school they need to code switch. And many of us that lived in an environment that's different than the positive schools and we had to go home to those places every night, we code switch. And teachers helped me code switch, right? We help, I help other kids code switch and say, we're going to show you something different, right? So I think really recognizing, not giving up on the kids, knowing that you're not going to probably stop what is the transmission, intergenerational transmission of violence in this country that's pretty robust. Mm -hmm. And we don't have as many family level interventions like family checkup that we need and we certainly can't reach all the families. We need to break the cycle and every kid that sits in front of you that has like a constant referrals for what's called bullying behavior, see it as adaptive and see it as adaptive in their context but see if you can get them to do something different. They can have two repertoires really. That's my opinion, and based on research. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Ron? I want to really support that. I've worked with a lot of perpetrators, and from all the way down to elementary school, they understand that there can be two mm -hmm. distinct environments, one at home and one at school, and when the example at school is supportive, they, they understand that, they can adapt to it, and then switch back and forth. They're very, very capable. We're selling ourselves short, or selling them short if we think they can't do that, or that they don't have the ability to do that. They do, they're very wise. The next question sort of relates to a different type of uh, adaptation, I'd say. This would have to be more sort of a Darwinian survival of the fittest um, uh, question. So, uh, bullying, does it, uh, across time, across cultures, uh, does it offer some advantage? Why, why is it still with us? Of course it does. Yes, yes, yes. This is why it's so hard to reduce. Um, some of the earliest writings on bullying was uh, conducted by Patricia Hawley, who studied primates in her dissertation. She's now in Texas Tech, and she still thinks that we're just kind of animals at the zoo, right? The same hierarchies we see in middle school and high school that the students talked about, those can be identified in primate populations at the zoo. If you took a class from me, we would have a field trip to the zoo. Why are we watching the primates? Because they look like middle school kids, right? And you have different <laughs> leaders and the gender dynamic and the, the type of aggression that's used. Um, now, I temper those comments depending on the state I'm in, because not everybody believes that we are somehow linked to the primate, right? So, um, so <laughs> but I'm in California, so I think I could do that. Uh, so, we certainly know from animal models that, that what we're seeing, uh, the adaptiveness, and when I just talked about the adaptiveness, there's a great paper that I can send you in developmental psychology that says what we can learn from the five tenets that we can learn from evolutionary psychology, and one is around aggressive behavior. This is why it's so difficult to change this, because you can identify hierarchies that really promote aggression. And so I think of a dear colleague of mine who, um, does great work in elementary sc schools, and he shows that if there's a hierarchical structure, and the teacher has kind of more popular kids, hierarchical structure, there's more aggression. If we teach the teachers to more, make it more egalitarian, so there's less, e that structure, there's less, less bullying, there's less aggression. The teachers aren't taught how to do that, right? And so, yes, I love that question, and yes, Darwin would be like, look at that, I told you. So. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got nothing. That was good. <laughs> Love it. Uh, the next question, maybe like to have uh, Raphael comment first, but then open it up to the to the whole panel. Um, I know Dorothy touched upon it uh, during some of her opening remarks, but the concept of of punishment and criminalization of, of bully bullying. Um, uh, most recently, a Senate bill uh, introduced uh, Audrey's law, uh, Senate Bill 838, um, in response to a, a young woman who was suicided after an, a sexual assault and pictures being posted on the internet 
Um, would that have helped? Does, would, do, would more laws help? Honestly, it's really difficult to say what that would really help. Um, victimization, I think it's just, it really all de depends on the person. I don't, I don't, it's kind of a difficult question to answer, honestly. Um, I remember I took a human sexuality class and we did this thing about, um, just about aggressiveness and just anything that gets to the point of bullying and then to the point of, we talked about smaller parts, we talked about cyberbullying. Um, it, I don't know, I think I'm just totally spacing out on that. Yep. Yes. Okay, <laughs> we can maybe open it up to others and if you have other ideas, you can come back. So others, the thoughts of criminalization of, of bullying and new legislation that's out there? This is a Joanne Ann Allen personal comment, no research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just, we need to have, you know, regulatory and, you know, like the construction and everything, but the more you criminalize something that is coming from hurt and pain and trauma, I mean, think about that. It isn't, is that the right thing to do? In those situations where you are, someone has, um, done something to harm themselves or others and you're criminalizing that, well, what caused that to happen? You know, I mean, is it the right thing? I mean, yeah, we have to have laws, we have to have stop things, but to really criminalize someone that is coming from a point of such intense pain or behavior that we, we it's the same thing as um, the uh, traumatic brain injuries or post-traumatic stress or any of those kinds of things. Are they criminals? Really, ask yourself that. I'd like to remind us all of how we fought truancy. Let's remind ourselves. What did we do when kids weren't showing up at school? We suspended them. That's not very good. We put them back on the street so they could go through your house while you're at work. We then find the parents. Remember this? We find the parents. Uh, we then were going to criminalize the parents if they didn't get the kids to school. This was all because we wanted the kids in the seat so that that kid could be counted for, let's not be confused about what that is, right? We needed that body. What we're now recognizing in truancy, and I think this is gonna parallel very quickly to the cyberbullying and just kind of criminalization of bullying, is now we realize that we had the kids sitting in the seat but they didn't wanna be there. So what happened is you had a kid that showed up because you find the parents or the parents who were going to spend some time in jail, you know, because we have so many cells to put them in. And so then the kid didn't want to be there, and what would they do? They'd act out so they can get suspended again. Only now our truancy in, is moving toward how do we build relationships between teachers and students so the students want to be there. We cannot criminalize parenting. We cannot, and this is essentially what we're doing with cyberbullying. In many of these legislations, it's going to be put on the parents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's well and good, because parents that monitor their kids their kids are probably not likely to get in trouble. There'll be a small percentage. The parents that already do not monitor their ch kids, we're just, I'm telling you, we are criminalizing kids that have undeveloped brains and do not have the adults around them modeling appropriate behavior, right? There was something, I don't know if it was in California, maybe it was, and when uh, Monday in LA was, I was there, there was a woman that drove her daughter to a fight and she helped her daughter in the fight, right? So what are we going to do with that? So I think we should learn from past mistakes. The legislation and the legal, this criminalization is coming from parents that are hurting deeply. And this is the way in which they're coping with the loss of their children. But I don't know where we're going to put these kids in some of these states. You can be up to one year in jail for engaging in cyberbullying, right? And what this young lady, from what I understand, with this new bill, there, she, there was sexual assault. I mean, yeah. This is major criminal behavior. It wasn't cyberbullying. It was major, major criminal behavior. Call it what it is. Yeah. And I just want to share about the truancy issue. I, in Santa Cruz County, what you're talking about, we now have a group called Keeping Kids in School that is looking about all those things that Dorothy's talking about. We're looking about trauma-informed care, restorative justice, creating situations to understand the why children aren't going into school, and we, even though we have our truancy mediation and SAR, school attendance review boards, we're looking at, wait a minute, huh, they don't wanna be here, why don't they wanna be here, what's going on, and how can we help them um, adjust and be better in our, in our classroom? So it's not just a body and a chair so we can get the dollars. So we really have someone, re like the Maslow's hierarchy, really 
they're wanting to learn and being able to feel safe and able to learn. So we're doing that in Santa Cruz. You probably don't know that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I think awareness is really the key. Um, because when legislature makes a law, then they kind of wash their hands, oh, that problem is over with, we've taken care of it, and then it leaves us to, to deal with the mess. Um, I, used, I clerked in law school for a federal judge, and he did everything he could not to put someone in jail or prison, because he said if they haven't gone bad yet, they will by the time they get out. So he would try to find programs. So criminalizing everything, just like the war on drugs, is not gonna work. We have to get to the roots of why we have a problem, and that's a lot more difficult. Any other thoughts about that? Or I think now that honestly clarifying up the door to especially <laughs> and Joanne, I think I really understood it more. Um, it definitely, education is probably the biggest part when it comes down to it because like what I was saying about human sexuality, once you do that, it's just defeating the purpose of it. If you do that, it's just a cycle. There's some kids I've seen before where they're, are you afraid of jail? No. Do you know what's gonna happen? Yeah. So why do you not care? I just don't. They just don't, it's, it just comes down to education. They just, like they said, they can go for one year, they can go for as long as they can, and sometimes they just don't learn. It just comes down to education, compassion, and just pretty much just learning. Legislature, it, I remember doing something like that too in the class too, where they said, will these laws, will these new things help out? It will help out, but that's not the answer. So I think it definitely comes down to the home, education, and just different aspects of life that can help out with just preventing it overall. Thank you. Um, today we heard several examples of school administrators and school teachers either not wanting to get it or not getting it or not having enough time to get it or enough patience to get it or whatever. Um, what is out there that's specifically aimed at educating the educators? I'm gonna look at the educator down there and then I'll, then I'll chime in. <laughs> Well, besides that huge salary we get, you know, <laughs> and the golden parachute, we're here because we're here for the kids. So when I work with uh, administrators, when I work with staff, th these are all people who want to help and they, they're looking for tools, you know, help me. Often it's down and dirty because they are overwhelmed with all the things on their plate, the newest test, no child left standing, whatever the new thing coming around. <laughs> um, so it's about helping and giving <laughs> teachers the tools so they can work with the kids, which is why they're there. They're there for their students. So it's education. And for me, I'm at the county office and I'm a regional lead and I have people calling me all the time. I, and I will go out, I just went to a middle school recently and sat down with them and talked, <laughs> looked at their safe schools plan, look at their policies, look at their programs. And they generally, they, they're so overwhelmed um, with what's going on, there's so many things going on, and it's just a matter of, okay, here's an easy way to do this. You know, it doesn't take a lot of work, here's how you can do it, and here's what you're doing already that you can just expand upon. Um, but it does get overwhelming when you have legislation that says thou shalt do X, Y, and Z, and you'll do it in this time frame, and you're going, what? And so my job at the county office is to co kind of go out and say, it's not that bad, let's just see what you got. Um, so there's those support systems for administrators to um, and assist with the policy writing and be that liaison between the state and the districts and the region and all these things. So that's what's available for administrators from the county office as well as the various programs that we have to help you address all these things. And linkages to, even though I'm not advertising them here because I can't, but when I'm with you one-on-one, -on -one, I'll say, well, did you try this? How did that work for you? And I'll, because I, I know a lot of different programs. Please. Um, in my own very humble way, <laughs> as a mom again, um, I totally understand how um, teachers are so busy. I know a lot of teachers. I know, you know, school's over, but it's not over for them. They still have hours of paperwork to do, and they're overwhelmed. And I know it's probably easier to say, what was that word? You know, was that kid bullying that kid? It's fine. It's probably really a lot easier to just kind of turn the other way because you guys are so overwhelmed. Uh, but as, as a parent, I'm, this is like a plea to all the teachers out there, counselors, um, you know, school staff, to consider the fact that just by paying attention, and I know, you know, going through all the paperwork and reporting everything, 
you don't know the, d the level of the bullying that's going on and it could be that they're just pushing that kid, but it could be that that kid goes home and considers suicide. You don't, you don't know how bad it is. You know, you might think it's not a big deal, I'm just gonna look the other way. A and not knowing that, that could happen. I mean, I know, and I've never discussed this in, in a room with my son next to me, but um, he's older now, you know, and um, when he was in middle school, and he was bullied. Um, I knew something, you know, he, I knew he was being bullied, but he, I don't know why, we've always been very connected, so I knew he was trying to protect mom, so he wouldn't tell me about it, um, but uh, deep in my heart, I knew something was going on. Uh, eventually, he told me, um, yeah, I've been bullied for the past two and a half years in middle school, and that just broke my heart. He told me what was happening and everything, and I said, wait, how can it be possible that all the things that had happened were not, you know, nonchalant kind of things. I mean, they were obvious, you know, like, you know, I'm not gonna go into it because he is here, but a lot of um, very aggressive behavior towards him. And that could have been seen, had to be seen, had to be heard by somebody in two and a half years. Nobody ever really wanted to maybe get involved. And like I said, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, how could they do that? You know, it, they're busy, they're overwhelmed, and they're probably thinking, you know, the parents will take care of it, maybe the kid is gonna defend himself. My son suffered so much for two and a half years, uh, not, he wouldn't tell me until I got it out of him, I don't know how, but I did. And, but before he told me, because I knew as a mom, and, and I'm gonna go into like the deepest, like the darkest hours as a mom. And uh, I remember walking um, from my kitchen to the hall to get to his room and he would always have that door closed. And I knew he was very, very depressed. And uh, we always been very connected. So I, I knew, you know, I was afraid. I was afraid he would do something horrible. So I remember for a long time and be in my shoes for like one time, you know, and it's hard. I would walk, you know, to his room and I, before I opened that door, I just prayed to God that my son would be there doing his homework or watching TV and that's all I wanted. I didn't know what I was gonna see when I would open that door and that happened for a long, long time. Um, I sticked with him, I mean, through so much and I think because I was so on him. I mean, I, I even, I mean, I can't think of the word, but um, I would tell him, you know, oh my gosh, honey, you know, what would you do if something happened to me? And he would say, oh mom, don't you? I would say, well, multiply that by three million and that's what, that's how I would feel if, you know, something happened to you. I, you know, I would die if something happened to you because I was so afraid um, he would commit suicide because he, he was so depressed and he would say things like, I don't get it, mom, you know, what, what is there to look forward to? And I mean, just a lot of things he would say that I thought, oh my gosh, he has, he, he doesn't see anything positive in the future because he's going to this place where he's being punished every day and I'm making him go there because it's school. And so I'm just, asking that, you know, as, as, a, as a, a school staff, teacher, counselor, when you see something, I know it's not your job. You're not the only person that's in charge, but if you see something, please take the time and do get involved and go talk to the kid and give him some hope. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's certainly something that all the research in the world is wonderful at, at that is, is it doesn't drive it home like a, like a real story. Can I add something? Um, I would add to that, that if there's teachers that are seeing things, if you could simply just keep your own kind of notebook, con connect with your dean of students, let your principal know, 
Uh, oftentimes, kids that are chronically victimized, more than one adult notices it, right? We had a particular case in the state of Ohio where um, a Croatian immigrant family moved into this state, and this particular affluent high school was known for um, the immigrant population being bullied, essentially. And um, they had had two suicides in the last year. Um, this Croatian uh, young girl was chronically victimized, and it was a huge high school, right? So sometimes you can just kind of, people aren't communicating, so it's huge, like 3,000 people. Well, it turned out after she took her life because they blamed her and sent her home for homeschooling, found out that her parents had been to the school, did not speak English, had to speak through the older daughter, uh, 40 times. This young girl had signed into the nurse's office 220 times, right? Uh, a security guard knew about it, a teacher over here, but they never talked, right? So just hyper-communicate, communicate, communicate. You, you don't have to necessarily, sometimes teachers hand it over to a dean of students and they assume that it was taken care of. If you see an escalation, if you see a child changing in their behavior, if they're dropping out of sport, that's a big, big sign if they're dropping out of sport, if they're not showing up to places where they used to be, that they look different. I don't think it takes that much extra work to say to somebody, I'm concerned about this student. I mean, I just think, I don't buy it. And we're all busy, but we all can ethically, we need to together communicate. And in many of these instances, when bullying happens, the parents aren't even called. Right? I mean, this is like basic kind of stuff. And I have to say, I work with really good administrators, too, that as soon as something happens, they're on top of it. So we don't want to make, put this message out there that it's everybody's negative. I have administrators that are just as stressed out as others, and they will make a phone call, and they will promise those parents that they will take care of that situation, and they do not have these things that go unaddressed. But we also do not hold schools accountable. We, need, we cannot just have parents pleading, please, please do your job. Just do your job, and let's hold everybody accountable. If we want to take on this youth suicide problem that we do have that's associated with depression, we have got to start talking to parents and say, administrators, if you're concerned about losing your job, then you're not in it for the right reason. You're in it to save kids. And you know, it's not complicated. Um, you see a child become quiet in the class as students stop talking, withdrawing, hood up, earphones on, not paying attention anymore. You see these personality shifts um, to hold them back after class, just say, can you stay after for a second? And sometimes just like, what's going on? Or I'm worried about you, or I've seen a change. Often they want to talk to someone and they don't know who to talk to. So just opening that door can often, they unload. Sometimes school is the safest place for them. And teachers can help them, they can save them, get with them. And I tell teachers, you don't have to have the answers. You just have to open up the communication, then we can get you the resources you need. We can get that student the resources they need. But you're so important. You make such a difference if you just take a second. So we've heard a discussion about the environment in which bullying arises. There are a couple of questions about the psychological makeup of, of a bully. Um, any research that's out there about that? Um, you want to pick up, Doris, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, so I talked about the ineffective and effective aggressor, right? So we do have um, a, a certain percentage of the kids that engage in these bullying behaviors that just have general callousness. Right? So it, it is the sociopath in some ways, that there's just a callousness and they're, they're on that trajectory to be antisocial personality disorder. What we don't understand more about is that, of it, that effective aggressor, right? Because we haven't really tracked um, in the United States with good measurement uh, the different types of bullying. Essentially, we just asked, did you bully as a kid? And then we said, that's not really getting to the nuances of this. There is some suggestion that some of the kids that engage in these behaviors actually go on to have very thriving careers in which they can supplement those, that's so Freudian, right? Supplement that, <laughs> that need for control and doblement into other, other things, whether they're, I like to say police officers, but um, that's just, I interview them when they pull me over for speeding tickets. And so um, <laughs> that doesn't help with the speeding ticket, but it helps with my field research. Um, <laughs> 
Some would say in the academy, I think I feel like I sit next to some folks that probably engaged in these behaviors. And certainly if you know, you're in criminal law um, and other professions where that type of behavior is valued and actually reinforced, um, then I think people find their way there. And so let's not see that these kids are just on that criminal trajectory. You could be sitting next to them in your workplace. You could actually partner with them for life. And um, so I think it's complex. I think human nature and, and the ways in which this, this behavior works for us in many, many, many ways. Um, and so what we try to do is to understand that it's adaptive, but if it starts to, to impact and, and there are victims around you, then we're concerned. So that's kind of a politician answer to say that there's all types of kids that engage in this behavior and they end up in all kinds of places and it's not always in a prison. So we usually save the last 15 minutes or so for wrap up, um, words of wisdom, parting thoughts, feedback to our community from our, from our panel speakers. Um, so maybe we can just um, start from one end to the other. Um, oh, I've said so much, I've lost my voice. Okay, we'll start with, <laughs> want to start with Ron. <laughs> um, but I think just education, more presentations like this so people can understand the dynamics, where it comes from, get rid of all the misinformation. There's so much misinformation out there and there's so many people that want to do good. I mean, that's our general nature. Um, so to empower people to step up, you know, I mean, all the studies say that that's really our nature is to help people, to work with people, to do good. Um, but sometimes we need tools and we need understanding. And in particularly in this field, we definitely need a lot more. Uh, well, like I said, um, to educate uh, the kids, you know, from day one when they're little, not educate them, I don't mean that, but um, so they learn about what to do in those cases. Um, And, I, and also, you know, the, the school staff to, to get involved. I, I, like I said before, it's, you know, it's not your job. You know, par parents should be, you know, they know, they should know what's going on with their kids, but sometimes they spend so much time in school, you know, to just get involved, to, to just, you know, take the, 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 the time to get involved and go, like Mr. Indra said, to go and ask the kid. You know, sometimes they just want to know that somebody cares. Um, so... Well, first thing I want to say, sorry if I couldn't speak much, is I think it's surrounded by all these educated adults. I couldn't really say much about these big <laughs> questions. <laughs> but what I could say is that everybody has their own position to help out. I think what, like my mom was saying, and everybody else was saying was, you know, it may not always be the teachers. You know, parents should help. I think anybody, whether you're a teacher, a counselor, a parent, uncle, friend, whichever, if you see something, just say something. The simplest thing. I remember, you know in high school when I finally came out my sophomore year, you know, I was unbelievably happy, you know, all my friends, I had all, you know, all these support and all this stuff, and people just started randomly coming out to me, and I was really confused, I was like, so, you know, and then they would talk to me, you know, they'd say, can I tell you something? I'm like, yeah, sure, and then they tell me, and I was really, you know, just surprised just that they would just come up to me and tell me this big thing, and it's just little things, like if I just, you know, for some reason said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to bother with that, you know, it's your own problem. Just helping out and just listening and just, I remember I heard this thing, I remember where it was, it was the four L's. It was look, listen, learn, and love. If you listen, you can actually listen and see all the things and look and witness all the things that just surround around you that you don't notice and that can really affect someone and affect yourself and affect someone else in a long-term effect. If you learn, you can teach yourself own new things and you can teach other people new things. And with that, if you can learn and if you can teach other people, then they can love also. Nice. So. Very nice, Rafi. I, I think you just educated quite a few educated adults, so thank you. Yes, very, very good. Um, so for me, my final word, it kind of falls along with that, but not so much, but it's um, introspective. You really need to know who you are and where your biases are and where, your, where you lay and what you feel about this stuff and how you want to be presenting things. If you look towards yourself and you want to be the change, you want to make sure your classrooms are safe, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, who are you, what are you doing? And if you just start, it sounds like a Michael Jackson song, doesn't it? Start with the person in the mirror. But, <laughs> yeah. but really, if you, that's just my message. If you just start with you, and look at you and how you relate to things and wow, 
I am judging that person. Where does that come from? Um, and, I, and identifying that and acknowledging it, like, oh, I understand. I need to understand about that particular group of people or that person or why my prejudices are coming out that I'm actually may say something that could be considered not so okay. And when you exhibit that behavior and you exhibit that kind of profile to young people and you be the answer, then you're, you're gonna help in a long way. And so it really starts, each person can do something. It's the power of one, as the movie said. Well, that's hard to follow, sorry. <laughs> hey, um, you, were, you were hard to follow yeah, too. Yeah, I get it. Payback. <laughs> I, you know, so I'm that kind of blend of some kind of researcher with their personal disclosure, so it's a little confusing for you all. She's still. Um, so, I mean, I think that one, we need to recognize that the bullying issue hasn't gone away in the last couple of decades. It hasn't gone away in the last three years, even with heightened awareness and the general public understanding that this is something we need to address. There are no quick fixes. It's going to take us quite a long time, and unfortunately right now, not to be the Debbie Downer, there's, um, there's some pushback in some of our states in this country, even for the, some of the strides. It feels as if we make some steps forward, and I feel like I'm walking backwards on some days. Not like the days I'm in Santa Cruz. This was just really good. This pushed me right into that. I'm motivated <laughs> for, the next, for the next year, um, so I appreciate that. But you're the consumers, right? There's a hyper-commercialization of bullying prevention. I said this this morning. When you have the Kardashians promoting bullying prevention for Sears, it's a very scary, scary phenomenon. <laughs> um, and I mean, I've been known to stop at that channel every once in a while and watch the Kardashians, and shame on me. Anyway, um, you know, and I've talked to Sears, like, do you think that really they're the best spokesperson for this? Um, and so I think that there's a hyper-commercialization. So the school districts and administrators are going to be sold programs that will not work. We have limited resources. We have to use the research to guide our decisions. If a program is not on the registry, or if it doesn't fit your context, do not implement it. It is a waste of your time. Do what you need to do to understand what's happening in your schools and your school, school district. There is not one size that fits all. I've written about this for two decades. What I do in Chicago Public Schools South Side versus the north side of the same district 52 miles away is very, very different. Within a district, a school could be two miles away from each other. They have different phenomena that they need to chase. Co collect your own data. You have your own data. Many of you will take the, do the youth behavior surveillance. Use the data. We're data driven. Remember we do this? And so if you don't have the monies to do an evaluation for things that you're doing, use the data that you already have in place. And I think also we cannot continue just to point at schools. I do a lot of work in schools, but my work has branched out in the last three years to include faith-based organizations. That's where the kids are. That's where the families are. We're starting to talk to coaches in the last two years. They, they thought, I remember when they called two years ago, and they said, we think we're part of the problem. I was like, you think? Um, <laughs> thanks for calling. Let's get to work. Um, after school programs, we have to recognize that anywhere a child resides, any context, that we have to send the message of caring, respectful behavior. I tend to talk to strangers wherever I go. It's probably going to get me in trouble at some point. Uh, Santa Cruz looks like a really good place to talk to strangers, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I talk to kids, and I'll end with this story. I was in a south side school, inner city Chicago, and I'm waiting for, it's one of those schools where they can't find the principal and the secretary's not so nice. So I sit there, I used to, I, you know, whatever. I sit in, in offices and I watch the climate. So it's not such a good positive school climate. This kid who's rather large, and I said, he was just a big kid. I was like, what grade you in? He was like six. I was like, wow, you can play football. You know, he's just big. And I was like, what did you do? He was like, I have to see the principal. I was like, what did you do? He was like, I'm big, so they think they can mess with me. And he said, and I, they come at me every, I said, I saw a little something happen over there before school. And he was like, yeah, they came at me and I just couldn't take it. I had to just pin them. I didn't hurt them. I just pinned them. And he, he thought we were going to have this ongoing conversation. And I just turned to him and I said, what's your name? And he said, Michael. And I said, so Michael, what's your favorite academic subject? I said, because it's going to be stressful when you go in there. So we might as well talk about something else. And he said, math. And the cause of principle is still never found. It was 15 minutes later. When I understood why he wanted math, why he liked to study math. I enrolled him in a math subject down in the summer program at the University of Illinois. And Mike now is um, going to be attending the University of Illinois. And it's all because I sat there and said, I changed one person's life. Every youth you have, 
We don't want to talk to kids that are being disrespectful on buses. We don't want to get involved because, they, you know, they could pull out a gun and they could shoot us. I don't know. We're all fearful. No, they're kids. Let's talk to them a kid about, let's talk to them about their behavior. Let's talk to kids. Let's reach out for them. They have aspirations. Their behavior does not define them. And Michael, that was the most, there's a lot of serendipity in my life these days, I have to say. And that was one case that was just a beautiful time where you can make a big difference. Big difference. One kid at a time. Yeah. So I'd like to end with a, a special thank you to all our speakers and our panel members and our high school students. A, a special thank you to the Nadine Calciano family. A special thank you to the Dominican Foundation, uh, to the committee planning uh, committee that works all year long to bring this together. Um, and an extra special thank you, you heard his name mentioned I think seven times today, to George, where is George? Ah. This, if there was a single person that makes this happen each and every year, it is George. And without him, George. this really wouldn't uh, come together. So thank you, George. Thank you. Oh, and of course, let's see. Uh, ooh, okay. Avoid Highway 1 South accident between Soquel and 41st. Uh, and please don't forget to turn in your evals and suggestions for next year's topic. All right, everybody, drive safely. Thank you.